Hello, lovely people. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Today, we're sitting with Alex from Recorder Connection. How are you, mate? Good, how are you? I'm fantastic. And uh, he's one of our apprentices, and we are going to talk about rock guitar production. So all I've done is I'm opening up this song by the Matthews, and three people ended up playing guitar in it. Max from the band, me, and then, of course, the great Tim Pierce. So it's quite a fun one to listen to. If we just listen to the track itself, just the chorus. It's heavy. I mean, it's basically like a, a sort of modern grunge rock. There's a lot of schnizzle going on in the drums. What's interesting about the drums, strangely enough, is they're recorded in this room. So there's hardly any mics. There's a kick drum, a snare top. You have, and you have room mics? No, no room no. mic. Wow. I got overheads, a hi-hat, toms, uh, and that's it. But the rest of it, to get this big sound, is some samples and a judicious use of reverb. Okay. A lot of it. So that's all just, it's just that little drum kit in there, 64 Ludwig. We add in our bass. So I did something quite different on this. O often when I do bass, I'll, I'll parallel compress. I'll, pa I'll do, I'll take, take the DI and then I'll make it just the bottom end and I'll take the amp and make that the personality and maybe distort it and create like something really driving. As oh, you can okay. see on this one, it's super clean. Yeah, it is. Just like, play with the fingers. It's pretty, I would say by my standards, a pretty natural bass tone. Yeah, what, what uh, the effect did you put on it before the EQ? Is, uh, that, is that a distortion? Area? No, it's a time adjuster. So what I'm doing is I am, let me show you here. What I'm doing is, if, I'll try and get as close as possible, is I'm pulling the waveforms back. So, what it is, it's come back 187 samples. Uh, if you look at it here, really depends on where you're analyzing it from, but it's fine. Okay. But what I'm doing is I'm dragging back the DI, here it is, to the amp. Oh. So that one's like 220. Whiny. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can manually pull them back. I just use time adjuster. I find if you, you can pull them back and kind of roughly line it up, but the only problem is, is like, I. I'm sort of superstitious. I like to leave stuff where I printed it. Yeah. I just do. And I don't use, I don't personally use the, the alignment software that you can use on drums and stuff. I like all the mics to be late or early or whatever they are and then figure it out afterwards. But what was great about this bass in particular was, let me just go out of group for a second, is the bass speaker. Listen to that. Yeah. That's insane. Nice. So what that is, is that is just that is just a, a speaker miking a speaker. So it's a 15-inch speaker cab okay. with another 15-inch speaker up against it. It's a Jeff Emerick trick. They use it on Taxman for the, with the 18-inch speaker. So it's a 15-inch speaker miking a 15-inch speaker. Pretty oh, crazy. yeah, it is. And that's just a standard. I think I probably, I don't remember what large diaphragm I had on it. It may have been a cheaper Neumann, like a TLM or something. This is a few years ago, it's two or three years ago. And then the DI is uh, a radial DI. So are you, are you are you doing for the for the bases, are you doing like uh, one has like more high end EQ, one has one more middle? Well that's what I would normally do, but I didn't in this instance. As you can well, I sort of did that. See, if you look at the DI here, which I've clicked on, I'm rolling off pretty dramatically at yeah. 92. Okay. And I'm doing the same thing on the amp. So Two together is this. 92 hertz. And then when I put in the bass speaker, that's where all the bottom end comes from. Because it's uh, the opposite. Yeah, One okay, yeah, I figured you'd take out all the highs. From... Yeah, but what I do usually is I go a little higher. Usually on the DI, I'll go to like 250, 200, and just okay. wipe everything above it and use the DI for the clean signal. Okay. Because the thing about DIs is they don't have, they, they don't have less, Distortion, they have less second, third harmonics, all that kind of schnizzle going on. It's yeah. literally just usually a pure signal. However, when I print a speaker, if I'm able to print a speaker, that just gives me, I mean, what am I doing with bottom end in this? I mean, it's just amazing. It does all the work for you because yeah. the speaker's just picking up the low end. That it's amazing. Sounds great. So, yeah, all together. So, I've got this, you know, how do I explain it? Just kind of like finger style, bass. 
sound, so there's no grit. Okay. Um, I've got the drums here, if I can like group a second and put the drums in. So I've got all the low end thumping along with the aggressive kick and snare. Mm -hmm. I'll go to Tim's guitars last because I did them last, let's do them in. So I had different guitars I was trying out. You can see like, there's grayed out ones I didn't like. Yeah. First of all, I've got a pair of acoustics, which run the whole song. All they're doing is adding, like... Color. Yeah, a bit of color, exactly. But these are my first real heavy guitar. And they are just absolute pure noise. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, from what I, re what I recall is it's, it's just a fuzz pedal, like the amp, if you want to get, if you want to hear the pedal and not the amp, set your amp like super clean, like absolutely clean, like no personality, plug for it, clang, the most boring guitar sound you've ever heard, and then put a fuzz pedal through it and you'll get this. And it's all Yeah, yeah. That's the sound of a fuzz pedal. And that's my big muff. If I take the EQ off, I'm doing a lot. It's a little low mid there. Yeah. Is this Waves? Uh, that's Waves, yeah. yeah. This is the REQs. Oh, the REQs. Yeah, okay. and that's gluing itself to the bass. So it's like the beginning of a disgusting guitar sound, like a purely disgusting 90s grunge guitar sound. So are you only using the fuzz for the chorus? I am. OK. But I just want to, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to shape a sound that's truly revolting, like just like really offensive. And that fuzz tone was just like, <laughs> You know what I mean? It just yeah, suddenly sounds like... Yeah. It just sounds like... Argh! Yeah. It sounds like a guitar vomiting. Which was great, <laughs> but I listened back to it. You know, I threw the acoustic guitars in. I listened back to it, and I'm like... Put in the vocal. It compliments it well. Take it. It compliments it well. Yeah, it works really, really good, but, it, you know, I took, a, I took a day away from the song, so I mixed a whole EP. And I'm like going, yeah, it's cool, but it sounds too 90s. It sounds too authentically 90s. And I needed a modern approach. And so, bada boom, bada bing, in comes Tim. So what Tim did is, he's, he's a melody guy, so he got, you hear that vocal, da, 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 da. so he added guitars that do everything, that pick up, listen to this. <laughs> And it's more like, it sounds like a modern rock guitar sound. Yeah. I mean, you know, Tim's played with Shine Down. You know, I mean, he's like, half of the stuff that's played on modern rock radio, he's either played on or playing on. You know? He uses a lot more modern tube amplifiers. Yeah. I, I recorded those completely flat. When you go and work with Tim, you, you basically get Tim's guitar sound. And as you can see, I'm doing no work to it. Yeah. Now, the other pair here, which I'll play you, is a driving high line. <laughs> Little delay on it. Again, he's following that melody. Yeah. Just like harmonizing. It's just play it's actually playing a straight a high octave with the fifth in it. Oh, okay. And that EQ is a bit more drastic. I took out all the low mids and the low end here. I take it off. It's all just kind of it's getting ugly now in the low mids. It's like oh, disgusting. So I pull that out. And now I've got the, the defining yeah. high guitar going. Put my revolting. And that's just, it's starting to sound like one big, horrible guitar sound in a good way. Yeah, give you that stink face. Yeah, and the bottom end now from the bass is just filling it in. Putting the acoustics. Put the acoustics in, it's like not even, it doesn't, it kind of distracts it away from like the, I mean like the distortion-y kind of fuzzy yeah, sound away from it. Definitely. So it's a combination of, of, of things. All the guitar sounds are very different from each other. Um, obviously the bass, I think, I could have taken the bass and put some high end on it and maybe high end distortion, maybe got a little bit of this. Well, what I like about that 
It's first of all the voicing. So yeah, so the voicing would have been like the the the, the A bar chord shape. I'm putting the fifth in the bass. So it's got that horrible ugliness to it. So what happens is like it's oh, okay. it really connects well with the bass guitar because it's got like a fifth in the bass. And so if you put the low note below it, you basically get like this root fifth, root fifth. You get just this big, ugly guitar sound. Then you've got classic rock Tim guitar sound. That's not true, not classic rock. Then you've got <laughs> modern rock guitar sound from Tim. With the high line driving. And like you said, the acoustics are like icing on the cake. Yeah, it really is. You know, what's interesting about this, and I think it's really important to talk about when it comes to like doing guitars and stuff like that, is I don't, I don't care if you hear everything. So what I mean by that is like, one of the biggest mistakes I, I see a lot when it comes to mixing and gets talked about in videos and stuff is like making sure everything's heard. No, you, you, you can just do stuff and when it's removed, you know that it's not there. So let's take out the fuzz pedal. Yeah, it gives it like a, like a kind of a tone. Like yeah, exactly. Means. So it's like it's like blending well with the other instruments. Yeah, exactly. It's like gluing things together. So if somebody hears this and thinks there's two guitars playing, I'm happy. Yeah. Sure. Which it does. Uh, yeah, that could be just like. And then a high line over the top of it. And if that's all that anybody hears is just two things, then great, my job is done. My job is not to like. EQ the schnizzle out of these guitars so that, you know, look at that. I mean, what am I doing on this? I'm boosting 200 on that guitar. On this one, I'm boosting 181. That's all I'm doing on those two guitars. Yeah, you're you know, really not doing that. No, that's all I'm doing. So, uh, take them out. Now it's polite. Now it sounds more like U2, which is fine. Put them in. Take them out. Put them in. Out. In. Yeah, it just glues with the bass yeah. and just makes everything sound offensive. You know, and, and yet you don't really quite know what it's doing. And I like that. That to me is just like, that's what rock and roll is. Everybody always talks about this. You know, we're in this world of like having a gazillion tracks. With guitars and stuff like that, if you could build a wall of massive guitar work, and then you can chop out slices of, of snares. I've seen people do that. I've done it. You know, like here's the here's the kick click at 7K or 2.5 and here's 60 hertz. And you can like literally draw in your, your song if you want a wall of guitar. Yeah. But it's going to give you no dynamics, no excitement. So sometimes I like this kind of like playing with things and just adding something just to add offense. I mean, I wanted this to be an offensive guitar sound. And it is. It is, yeah. Ugly. <laughs> That's another thing. We're listening in solo to hear stuff. And one of the biggest mistakes I've made, and I've seen a lot of people make. Using it too much. Well, yeah, they solo things and they spend ages on a guitar sound which sounds amazing on its own. Yeah, but you want it to sound better with everything. Yeah, in the track. With everything. I mean, if, you, if anybody ever heard those Queen multi tracks and knows I'm obsessed with Queen, like some of those guitar sounds are the ugliest things ever. You know, especially when Brian May's layering like 15 different harmony guitar parts, mm -hmm. they'll get like, Nyeh! you know, like all yeah. these different dark sounds and sometimes mics sound like they're off axis. Yeah. That's what's fun about what we do. That's what makes Definitely. recording fun when you get to do this kind of stuff. I mean, this is a dumb rock song. It's just down, 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 you know, ba, da, 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 da. It's not going to win any awards for guitar arrangement, but we got to have some fun with it yeah. and really kind of do some cool stuff on it. Now, like in the verse here, for instance, we've got. We've got okay, Tim yeah. doing like a little edge piece. And this was the original part that we did using that BFG Les Paul. So you can keep that, this one in? It is in, they're in together. They're building off each other. I went for dumb. I went like, I wanted this song to be really, really dumb and concussive and just smash you over the head. Um, but I found that, I mean, that part's great against yeah. this one. And that's ugly. 
And what that is, is that that's my Les Paul going through, what happened with it? Oh, going, going through a Marshall, but I'm using a wah pedal. Okay. So the reason why it's going, and it's kind of ugly, is I took the wah pedal and I tipped it forward till it just sounded like high mids, and there's no bottom end on it. Oh, so you see there's no EQ on it? Yeah. That's just the sound of it. And it's oh, so thin. you just have like a, just a steady like hold on the wah. Exactly, held oh, okay. in one place. There's a pedal called a uh, Q-Zone that does the same thing and you can sit there and set it. And that's a, that's a pedal you use just the rotary control. Um, so oh, I wow. did that and then Tim came along and uh, we added this. And you can tell I took out the low mids, I don't need. Yeah. You put it in, you can hear it bite a little bit over top, take it out. And then there's an 1176, which is actually doing quite a lot. I love 1176, comes stock with Pro Tools, God bless it, free of charge. And then in the pre-chorus, this other guitar comes in. So it just plays a beautiful harmony to the part that I already had. Yeah. Yep, it's a pre-chorus. Chorus, we've got acoustics. And so that part comes in how many bars after the solo? That other... Okay, it's the, it's the pre-chorus, so it's the second half of the verse, if you like. Okay, so I've got some little tricks, some like EDM-y kind of things that I built for dance tracks that I was using in this, even though it's not a dance song. So you got this here. Reverse cymbal. Yeah. And that's a kick drum and, and a cymbal pushed together and I just turned into, a, I call it an explosion. Yeah, reverse kick, reverse cymbal. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, that's a kick and a cymbal just hitting. So yeah, it's kind of fun. I enjoyed making that. <laughs> and I use it on a lot of songs. So we got that transitioning into the chorus. And then coming up next. So that's just smothered in verb. Okay. Yeah, I like the deep verb. Again, laid back in the mix quite heavily. You know, I just love that kind of stuff. It's barely audible, but it's just in there. It's the same thing, it's the wire pedal set in a high position. That's why it's so offensive, and that squeaky kind of guitar sound. Super ambient. I yeah, like super ambient. Just, it's just a good old fashioned, yeah. comes free of Pro Tools Diva. Again, I, I, I'm not proud, you know, <laughs> just whatever works. Hey. It's amazing what you can do with such simple plugins. Yeah, and not being precious about the guitars yeah. and stuff. At all. There we go. It also helps that the guy, he was 16 years old, can sing his butt off. This guy was singing since 16? 16. He's 18 now. Was it you me? Was it you me? I was just talking about this to somebody on uh, YouTube was answering a question. So they were asking me about they they had tuned a vocal and then they put doubles and stuff to it and they say it sounds like a robot. Well, this is the lead vocal. Was it you me? As you can see, if there's only tuning on there. Who, who the heck knows how? I mean, it's all over the place in a cool way. Was it you or me? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Is it just yeah. reverb? Yeah, there's reverb delays. 
And then... So what I did is I I took this other vocal and sort of vocal aligned it to it to get them. That's that's what that acronym is. Uh, yeah, there. okay. If you tune them together, not that it's possible when you have that much personality and grit in the voice, but if you did tune them together, it would sound like absolute schnizzle. It just sounds so bad. It doesn't sound like a bad robot, but together, it's so good. Just time. Yeah, that's right. And I love the out of time. It's amazing. Was it you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extra breath yeah, in there, that extra. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these, these guys are Irish, so there's, that's why you hear all that kind of Bono stuff in it. Them slightly being pic pictured to each other gives it wit, makes it sound fat. And you added this reverb on it. Yeah, that sounds so good. Did you record this on the flea? Nah, this was, uh, this was, you know, I can't remember. We tried different things. We did try 57s with him handheld because he was so young and I wanted him to have fun. But I think we ended up using a 47. Okay. We threw the big guns at it. <laughs> Was it you and then there's my usual vocal thickening trick. Yeah. And a distorted yeah. delay print. Yeah. Yeah. Are these I'll all the do, same track? Yeah, the same vocal track, but printing to lots yeah. of different crazy effects. I just... I, yeah, yeah. I learned this. So I talk about this a lot. So, but I learned this from from Jack Douglas and and Dave Jordan. Dave Jordan showed me the uh, vocal thickening trick to detune and and yeah. pitch it up and down. But Jack's whole thing is he said that when he was working with John Lennon, they would do. You met Jack earlier today. Yeah. Um, when, um what uh, Jack Jack would do is he'd have a crowd noise from like a soccer match, like going, oh, okay. and they have that underneath the vocal. And then they gate it to the to the lead vocal singer. Imagine all the people be like, rah, 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 rah. Wow. and it's like just under the vocal. So you get to the point where you can't hear it, except when you mute it, you're like, oh, there's energies just disappeared from the vocal. What happened? So again, it's back to that idea. You know, this is one of the things that you know when we're in the wonderful world of digital that we ha we we forget to talk about. We're, Everything can be so perfect and so EQ'd and so this and so that, which is, you know, I'm sure that's a wonderful thing in many situations, but what it doesn't do is give you that wrongness that we like. And I love the wrongness, you know. I I watch lots of tutorials where they spend a lot of time like sweeping and like pulling out this EQ and it gets really great. And then I end up with this perfectly mixed, everything in the right place, yeah. concussive, really super loud track that has absolutely no emotional context whatsoever. And like, you know, all the stuff that we love is always just a little wrong. And, you know, it takes skill to do it wrong. It's not just a case of going, oh, you know, I'm not going to perfect that. Of course, you, of course you don't want like a 700 spike in an instrument just going <laughs> blah, 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 through the middle of your track. Of course you don't want that. But you don't want to just sit there with your, your fab EQ sweeping everything and pulling out every single little peak so that it literally sounds like a lifeless piece of whatever. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's the wrongness that we love. Um, and sometimes, you know, things are very well recorded. And if you're using virtual instruments, they're pretty amazing. They're yeah. like perfectly recorded by incredibly talented people in the best sounding room recording that piano. And you maybe want to double it with a different instrument and add a distortion to it. You can do it with, it doesn't have to be just vocals, you can do it with instruments, just something that messes it up. You know, I'll do, if I've taken a, a, a really nice piano sound, I'll sometimes run a delay line against it and distort the delay line at the wrong tempo. So it's like, glan on glan, and it's like, you know, it's like this weird, yeah. but underneath just makes everything a little wrong. So you're trying to think, how can you screw it up? How can you make it more interesting? So that philosophy that Jack taught me and Dave Jordan taught me and people a lot smarter than me taught me was just kind of the wrong is what you love. The humanity, that like screwed upness, I can't really think of a better way of putting it. Yeah. Is is what I connect to, and we all kind of connect. Who does that? Now oh, that that was uh, that yeah. was Max. That was a guitar player. What did you automate right there? It's it's actually just a performance uh, using a trem. It's not uh, it's not slowed down. I don't believe I don't believe it's. 
<laughs> it's like it's like uh it's like uh just it's yeah it's just a trend. Oh. I remember I did a record with Andrew Frampton and Andrew did uh wrote and produced like the script and, and a whole bunch of other bands. And I remember when we were doing this song together, um, which we, we actually all co-wrote together, um, I played the main acoustic line on it and I used a DI and I plugged it straight into the front of a mic print. And we started tracking with it. Then we like did the rough mix. And before doing the rough mix, I went in and I got this beautiful, you know, my beautiful acoustic and I mic'd it up and I replayed the part and edited it beautifully and it yeah. sounded amazing. And then we, we had a high line and we got a distortion pedal out. Anyway, so I sent Andrew the rough and he's like, what happened to the song? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, this, this doesn't sound this doesn't sound exciting or wrong like it did when I was in the room. And he's like, wait there, is that your crappy DI'd acoustic anymore? I was like, no, 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 I, I replayed it properly. And he's like, what? Why did you replay it properly? And I was like, well, you know, I wanted a bit of tone. And he's like, no, no, no. We built the whole song because we sat and wrote the song in a room and then tracked to it. And it's a great, great song. And I just completely destroyed it by putting in this really well recorded acoustic guitar. When the DI crappy, and it was like limited by input and was clipping on the way in, it was like this big square mm -hmm. blob of acoustic guitar, which, you know, if you sent to somebody to mix, they'd be like, this is awful. But it was, it was completely dictated. So I've always taken that to heart. And when we did the guitar overdubs again with him, he just was like forcing us to just, to just do wrong things. Though, yeah. Really Again. Like I mean, yeah, not by itself. Someone probably thinks it's like. Yeah, like if you show that to anyone, they'd probably think it sounds terrible. But when we put it in the mix, it sounds. I think it's amazing. Yeah. Adds to the chaos now. <laughs> I'm watching like a typical rock YouTube breakdown or something like that. It'll be like this yeah, perfectly played. Yeah. Like it's like no, dude. It's 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 the craziness of that. It's just in there subliminally, like. That's so crazy. Well, there you go. That's like, that's one on one overview of the production. I mean, it, it, when you're talking a, a, with a band, talking about a band like this, which is essentially a guitar rock band, I mean, the way you treat the guitars is the sound of the band. And then you've got a singer that can just wail like that. Like those drums, I think some of the drums I played and some of the drums my old engineer, Phil, played. That's why we did them in this room. You know, okay. we just. We would just redo stuff. Just take the inspiration and do something great. To mix these five songs, they recorded with different different people playing drums. Um, I don't hit the drums very hard. Phil hits the drums much harder than me. So I did spend a bit of a time getting the drums to sound big, considering they are just five mics with samples. Yeah. You know, so yes, I definitely had to spend time getting getting a bigger drum sound than that little room in there. Yeah, that kick's nice though. So, but for me, you know, I was working with David Foster the other day and I've always said this, sorry, but it's lo lovely to hear somebody as amazing as David Foster. I'll gonna be one of the biggest producers ever. He, and he said, he said the only things that matter, he actually said the kick drum, he said the only thing that matters is the kick drum and the vocal. And uh, I think I've always said drums and vocals, but he's kind of right because his whole point is like, when you're walking through the mall, what do you hear? You hear like, I don't try to work on you. God, yeah. You don't hear. You don't hear like all these intricate 57 different parts yeah. that are going. Dr it is, drums and a vocal. It's the and it's, beat. Yeah, it's the beat and the vocal. So, what I essentially did, I probably spent a little bit of time on the drums on this as first because I was taking five a five drum drum kit and trying to turn it like it was being played in a freaking huge arena. I want people to think like U2 and like huge rock when they hear this. I don't want them to think. <laughs> I didn't want them to think like, oh, it's like a little drum kit and you know, some <laughs> yeah. guys are trying to be punk rock or something. No, I wanted big rock. Um, so there was that. So I definitely spent time on the vocal, uh, um, on the drums, but the next most important thing on this mix, and, but the most important thing on every mix is the vocal. I've got all my usual suspects going on. It's not as much, I mean, it's got a de 
an, an EQ, and I have this tendency, like, I'll DS, I'll control before I cut and boost. So by DSing, I'm getting rid of some high end. I'm getting rid of some high end distortion that might be coming out from the S's and the T's and yeah. just that extra kind of like five ish K, which is really offensive for our ears. So. With my head on the water and you tell me there you go. Sell me, sell me. Yeah. So that's the first time it hit. And then I'm going into an, an EQ. With my head. So that's boosting the top end that some of it I might have just cut, and you're like, what? Well, what I'm doing is I'm controlling it. So like I'll do it with bass as well. Like I'll control the signal going into a boost because if I didn't put that on and I boosted it, it would just take your head off. So what I'm trying to do is even out the signal so there's no excessive top end so that when I boost the top, boost the signal after that, I'm making the whole vocal not brighter, not just picking out something that's gonna blow your head off. Um, and then, believe it or not, is another DSA. With my head. And again, it's picking up the same area. So then, believe it or not, well, it's an REQ wiping off the low end, going into a compressor. With my head on the wall. This is like, it's not doing much. You can see it's only doing a couple of dBs worth of gain reduction, but I love the Waves Renaissance compressor just on its standard setting. It adds some, some little kind of blippiness to it, which is pretty freaking awesome. And then, of course, an Arvox. With my The Arvox is one of my favorite compressors. Um, it's dark, it's got low mids and all this kind of stuff, so some people don't like it. I love it. When I went to work with Michael Brower, um, he's mixed a bunch of records for me, and he obviously is famous for mixing Coldplay and a whole bunch of other huge acts. He had the Arvox on first in the chain, so quite often I'll put the oh, Arvox wow. the first on. Yeah. And then uh, grinding again. And then guess what? DS in again. So you're gonna think I'm crazy, but my whole idea is I'm trying to get this vocal to feel really airy. And so what I'll do is I'll compress, I'll, I'll EQ into compression, and I'll okay. DS before EQ. And the reason why I do that is I'm DSing to catch those abrasiveness, so when I boost it, I'm not just blowing your head off with the S's and the T's. Okay. Um, because if you do that, you might not, if you, might, if you put the EQ on first, you might go to yourself, oh, I don't like what it's doing to the vocal. No, it's doing, random things to the vocals that you don't want to uh, hear. Yeah. So you control it with a DSA going to an EQ. God bless it, you've now got a brighter one. I then put another DSA on because I was like, oh, it's brought out a little bit too much. So people say to me, why are you using like five or six or seven or eight or nine plugins? Why don't you just use one and two? Because obviously con conceivably you could use a uh, DSA, EQ, compressor, all in one plugin. Well, that's not how I work and that's not how my brain works. I might DS and EQ and listen to it and think it sounds great, then add another guitar and go, oh, did my vocal just cut a little bit more? I don't go back to the drawing board. I don't pull off everything and start all over again. I go, I want it to be a little brighter. So I brighten it. And then if I think it's a little harsh, I'll put a DSer. And then I'll be like, well, I want to just push it back and compress it so I can turn it up and there's more fullness to the vocal. Because obviously if you compress areas that are sticking out, dynamics yeah. of the vocal, you can turn the whole vocal up. So these are like important things that I think have to be explained. Quite often I'll automate EQs and compressors. Do you ever compress vocals before EQing them? Often I will put an Arvox, the first thing I do on a, on a vocal here. Okay. The Arvox is like, it's a special plug. In the olden days of like 15, 20 years ago, God, the olden days, uh, we used to use a lot of compression. Yeah. And what I mean is like serial compression. Like when I record vocals now, I still go 160, uh, 160 VU until 1176. I used to molt, and quite often I'll molt two sets of 160s and 1176s into one, catching different levels of dynamics that makes the vocal feel really open. So the softer stuff gets compressed, and then the higher stuff gets less compression, but only kicks in there, oh, okay. and it keeps the vocal sounding massive. Yeah. So I'll do things like that. But when we would do things like recording guitars, if we wanted the guitar to be huge and upfront, we would put it in a super dry environment, like maybe in an amp box or something, or in a room and pad it all out, put a 57 on it, and then compress it, compress it, compress it, and compress it, but lots of small amounts and increments, and you would get that typical kind of early Queens of the Stone Age, super dry, upfront, like guitar sound, and that was like many levels of compression, just tapping it, 
And so the, a lot of recording we, we would do like that. We'd use a lot of compression, but we'd use it, use it in many, many different ways, regardless of EQ. And so it would come in on tape, sometimes with three or four compressors on it, but all hitting lightly. And remember every compressor, especially obviously hardware compressors as well as plugins, but hardware compressors had totally different sounds. Yeah. Like 1176 is very famous for being crunchy. LA3 is one of my favorite, favorite guitar compressors. Um, it's just like, it has that spanky kind of, it almost reminds me of like Rihanna. Rihanna. It just instantly sounds like the 70s to me. Yeah. So there's like certain things that you, you would use to give certain sounds. I mean, that was the beauty of going to a large recording studio with tons of outboard. Because you're like, oh, I want that guitar sound. And you plug into here. Or I want that. Or I want that. Now, of course, we have plugins which do all of those things and more. You know, we would parallel compress on a console. Like I put the lead vocal through a channel and then I put it through in the channel next to it and then compress the schnizzle out of that one and push it up underneath. Nowadays, you put one compressor on it, squash it really, really hard, and then run a mix control. So now you've got that really compressed parallel vocal built into a compressor. I mean, plugins have enabled us to do so many things that used to be so difficult to do yeah. on consoles. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah. There's the song. Excellent work. Sounds great. Thank you. So uh, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. We covered a lot of stuff, not just guitar production, but hey, we always do. Thank you ever so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing and leave loads of questions and comments. Goodbye. Okay,